Good morning. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, <clears throat> beginning in verse 11, a familiar story but worthwhile. And Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. Now when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his fields to feed the swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating and no one was giving anything to him. But when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I am dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. So he got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his slaves, quickly, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf, kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. Now his older son was in the field and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing and he summoned one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received them back safe and sound. But he became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command of yours and yet you have never given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed a fatted calf for him. And he said to him, son, you've always been with me and all that is mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and has begun to live and was lost and has been found. The parable of the prodigal son is, among other things, a story about how God shows his love in ways that we can relate to as human beings. You see, God loves us in big ways, ways that are evident but hard to relate to as human beings. Let me give you an example. The sun in the sky that provides for so many of our needs. This is a big way that God shows His love to us. The way that He has ordered history, another example, in order to provide a savior to die for our sins. This is another big proof of His concern for us. And so there's no doubt that these and other actions on God's part demonstrate His great love for each of us. But here's the problem. The problem, of course, is that none of us have the power to create a star. None of us are able to manipulate history, so it's difficult for us to fully appreciate God's big ways to love us. Okay, he made a star, but I can't make a star. I don't know what that's like. But in the story of the prodigal son, however, we see the intimate human ways that God, our Father, loves us. Ways that we as human beings can understand and relate to ways that a father loves his child. When we review this parable, we see three ways that this father showed his love for his son. And by extension, three ways that God shows his love for us. First of all, the father 
let his son go. That was one way he showed his love for this child. He let his son go. Now it was customary in those days for the eldest son to not only receive a double portion of his father's inheritance, but also to be the first one to do so. It was also customary to wait until the father died or the father chose to parcel out his wealth to the children. But this child, this younger child, he didn't wait his turn. He didn't wait until the father decided to give. He demanded his portion right away. And we see that the father, without a word, gave him his portion and he let him go. He let him go against wise counsel. He let him go without manipulation. He let him go no strings attached. When the son was old enough to make his own decision, foolish as it was, the father let him make that decision. He loved him enough to let him go. God, our father, is like this. He lets us go as well. We are free to disobey him if we want to. We can reject and abandon the church if we choose to. We can ignore all the wise counsel of His word and the promptings of His Holy Spirit and go our own way if that's what we want to do. You know, some think that God should kind of throw a thunderbolt to stop us. Just stop me, God. If, you, if I'm doing something you don't like, just, just stop me. We think, we think that, that that would be love. But love means leaving the door open not locking it up like a prison. God loves man enough to allow him to be free. He loves man enough to risk rejection in order to gain true faithfulness and love in return. He doesn't make the mistake that some fathers make in confusing control with compassion. There's a difference. God loves enough to deny self and allow his children to choose the way they live and live the way they choose. But like the father in the parable, God's love doesn't end with goodbye. Another way fathers love their children. Fathers wait for a return. You know, Mothers, mothers pray, <laughs> mothers pray. I know this because the mother of our children, Lees, is a praying woman. She has stacks of prayer notebooks that she's filled out with her prayers in the last 40 years. Mothers hope But you know, fathers, fathers wait. That's what we do. We wait silently, expectantly, fearing the hurt, ready to receive. I remember when Emily, our youngest daughter, got a car. She was barely 16 years old. And then she got a job. Uh, she worked at the movie house, the movie theater, old Crossroads Mall, remember that? When it was a mall, when there were people going there. And of course, if you work in a movie house, you don't work in the afternoon mostly, you're working at night, on the weekends, things like that. And many times she was on the final shift where they'd have to close down and she'd finish maybe 11.30, quarter to midnight. And she had to take the same way home. It was agreed, you take this way home. I knew to the minute how long it took. If you drove 55 miles an hour along that road, how long it would take you to get into the driveway of our house in Midway City. And the deal was she would call. Phone would ring. Okay, dad, 
I'm on my way. All right. And I remember many times <laughs> she would come into the house, 12.30, 1 a.m. And I, I'd be sitting there next to the door. And she would say, Dad, you didn't have to wait. You didn't have to wait. You could have gone to bed. She didn't understand. Fathers wait. It's what we do. The father in this story here, he wasn't barricaded behind closed doors. He didn't have the locks changed as soon as the son left. He was expectant. He made himself available at the first glimpse of the son's return. God loves us like that. He waits expectantly for our return. He makes himself visible all the while. Everywhere there are signs of God's presence and His love. If only we would just open our eyes and see them. The beauty and the love demonstrated by His creation that shelters and feeds us. The will and consciousness that possess and continually attests to our ability to choose right from wrong this given to us by a loving father. The freedom to choose was given to us by a loving father. The Bible that speaks of God's love and provides assurance and guidance for a good life here and an eternal life with God in heaven, these are all signs of God's love, reminders of His concern for us, no matter where we go. He's waiting. He waits. The father in the parable had great faith. At one point he said to his older son that the younger son had been dead, but now he was alive. And you know what? This was a fair assessment of the younger son's condition. He was gone, he was unfaithful, he was a destitute, he was dead to God, dead to his family, dead to his people. But the father waited for this dead son's return. Such is the foolishness of fathers who love their children. They hope, even against hope, to receive them back, even from the dead. God's love is like this, in that while we sin, while we ignore Him, while we harm ourselves, while we mock Him, and all that He has done to show us His love day after day after day, He's showing us He waits for us. He plans for and works each day to win us back, and He waits anxiously to see us from afar off returning to Him. And when we do return, God displays His greatest show of love. And that is, He restores us when we return. He lets us go, He waits for us to return, and then when we do return, He restores us back to sonship. You know, it's one thing to take back an erring child, it's quite another to restore an erring child. You see, in the parable, what the son wanted was to be taken back. Just take me back, give me some food and shelter. I'll earn my keep, I'll, I'll act properly, I'll do what you say. It's what he deserved. It was better than what he deserved to find shelter and food. What he was asking for was to live under new rules, to live under self-imposed law. He was ready to trade that. But what his father gave him was not rules. What his father gave him was restoration. The father's gifts in the parable showed how the son was restored. 
the father quieted him in the middle of his apology with kisses. Can you not just see the scene? The son's coming back and the father embraces him and the son begins to speak. And he says, now father, you know, I've been bad and I've been, you know, and if you take me back, you know, I'm going to do what you say. And the father's just hugging him and kissing him. Quiet, let me love you. He silences him with his love. The father felt compassion, which told the son that he understood the son's pain and the effort it took to come back. He put the best robe, which signifies position. You see, long robes were worn by nobles, not servants. The ring he gave him is a mark of sonship, belonging, the father took him back as his son, not his slave. The sandals signified that he was not to be treated as a slave because slaves went barefoot. The fattened calf and the celebration was also a most precious gift as well because the father through this celebration gave the son the right to laugh again, the right to experience joy again, because with forgiveness comes restoration and with restoration comes joy. Otherwise the son ever after, if ever there was something funny or humorous or wonderful, would always temper his laughter, would always hold back his joy because he'd be saying to himself, yeah, I'm the one who screwed up. I'm that brother. I'm the screw up brother. So everybody around here is going to laugh and have a good time, but I, I can't laugh that loud because I'm, I'm the one who messed up. I don't have a right to be here. I'm here under you know, everybody's grace. But what the father gave him was the right to laugh again, to rejoice again, to be part of the family again, as an equal partner. The father restored his son back to sonship with all of its rights and privileges. He even defended him to his older brother who was jealous of his father's goodness and mercy. He would have preferred some you know, legal arrangement. The older brother would have. Well, God our Father in heaven is this kind of father. When we return to him, he doesn't give us what we deserve or what we've earned. He restores us completely as sons and daughters. No more sin. He forgives all sins. That thing you stole, that abortion you had, that divorce you had, that lie you made, that cheating you did, that adultery you're guilty of, that porn you consumed, whatever. Acts 2.38, what does he say, Peter? Repent and be baptized, and what happens? For the forgiveness of your sins. He doesn't say for the forgiveness of most of your sins, some of your sins, you know, categorically your sin. No, 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 no. For the forgiveness of all of your sins. No more sin. No more shame. The Father covered him with a robe. Our Father covers us with Christ Himself. All those who have been baptized into Christ, what have we done? We've put on Christ, Galatians 3. No more condemnation. He doesn't accuse us anymore. And he doesn't allow anyone else to accuse us. I've said this before, if God doesn't accuse you, then you should not accuse yourself. And you should never allow Satan to accuse you. If you're a son or daughter of God and some voice in your head is accusing you of something, you can be sure that that is not Jesus doing that. That's somebody else. Paul says there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8, 1. No more condemnation. 
No restitution to be made. The cross makes restitution. The thing you owe God for all the bad stuff you've done has been paid for in full by the cross of Christ. First Peter 2, 24. By His stripes you've been healed. No more sadness. Why? Because we have the hope of heaven. Why does Paul say in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, rejoice always, why? Because we're never sick, we never have the flu, we're not getting old, my sore back, I'm losing my hair, whatever. Is that why we should rejoice always? No. We should rejoice always because we have the hope of heaven before us. That's why we should rejoice always. Not for our present circumstances, for the future. We have hope. In addition to this, God our Father defends us against the constant charges of Satan that we are unworthy by keeping the blood of Christ and the prayers of the Holy Spirit constantly at the throne of mercy on our behalf, defending us, justify. You know, I don't have to justify myself before God. The cross of Christ does that for me. If only I would let him do it. When the heavenly Father restores us, He restores us to our heavenly position as sons and daughters of God, occupying the right hand of His throne with Jesus Christ. This parable teaches us many practical lessons for fathers and parents in general. First lesson, the purpose of our work with our children is to eventually let them be what they choose to be, even when that doesn't match or even remotely match what we want for them. I think the phrase that our children heard most often from me was, it's your life. I want to help you live it. I want to give you the tools. I want to give you everything you need. But in the end, there's only one vote that counts and that's yours. Why? Because it's your life. You see my life? I made choices and this is where I am. This is my life. So I want you to have the same freedom to choose because it's your life. Secondly, another lesson, we as parents, we can let go, but, but, excuse me, we can let go, but we mustn't ever give up. There's a difference. We still can have influence in a relationship with our children through prayer, through love, and a willingness to monitor and encourage their progress and sympathize with their failings. And then finally, Christian fathers don't ever say, I told you so. They say, I love you so. They say, I love you so. When the prodigals come home, they don't make slaves out of them. They make sons and daughters once again out of them. This parable also demonstrates to the very real way that God deals with us, His children, especially His wild children. Because there are wild children. And wild children need love and patience. The prodigal son was a wild child who finally came home to the arms of a loving and forgiving father. This is the essence and the beauty of this parable and it is relevant in every place and every time where fathers wait patiently for the return or the turning around of their prodigal sons and their prodigal daughters. If you're a young father, be prepared to wait this will be your calling. And so I ask, what about you? 
Have you gone far away from your heavenly Father? You're only there because He let you go, but remember, you got yourself there. He never wanted you to go. This very moment, the heavenly Father waits for your return, no matter how far you've gone, no matter how bad you've been. You can always come home to the arms of your loving heavenly Father, even if your earthly Father will not have you. Because He has your robe of righteousness. He has your ring of sonship, of daughtership. He has your sandals of peace and freedom. And the feast is being prepared in heaven where the singing and the rejoicing has already begun. Won't you come home to your father this morning if you need to? by coming forward as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.